What's up, guys? It's my favorite edition of Delver. This is the Pro Tour recap episode where we go over everything that happened last weekend at Pro Tour Minneapolis. I guess it's Pro Tour March of the Machine. Anyway, we're going to run through everything that happened last weekend, give you the cliff notes, celebrate uh, competitive magic, and then we have one little piece of magic competition news that we'll go over at the end but let's dive into the pro tour from the previous weekend for anyone that was in minneapolis anyone that you know spiked the events definitely congratulations to all those that partook um congratulations to all those that got a chance to go and even for the people that were just at the festivities and not necessarily taking part in the tournament or the pro tour uh, i hope you had a great weekend and i hope that minneapolis treated you well and you got to see all your favorite people and play lots of magic very exciting time to be a magic fan uh, let's dive into the pro tour uh, minneapolis recap uh, last week or last episode two weeks ago we went over the standard metagame uh, for Pro Tour Minneapolis. This was all of the registered decks. Um, there was a few surprises. We were surprised to see that Esper Legends wasn't climbing up past Grixis Midrange. We were surprised to see Grixis Midrange hold steady in the top three. Um, and then we were surprised to see that Mono White have kind of, has kind of fallen off of the radar a bit. I think there's a lot of great sideboards uh, against mono white right now and it proved to be a difficult tournament for for that deck uh spoilers so obviously players were sleeving up decks that were competitive against some of the bigger decks that uh we'd seen in previous tournaments uh in recent months and with a couple new cards from march of the machine that uh, mono white kind of game plan kind of burnt and fizzled thanks to some new red burn cards um but yeah so we went over that last episode so definitely check that out if you're interested in a little bit more of an in-depth breakdown on the pro tour march of the machine uh metagame but um we'll jump right into the festivities uh from the weekend friday we started off with a three rounds of draft in pod um, one thing that they did for the draft that was really awkward and I think needs to be fleshed out a little bit more is that they had the players reveal the double-sided cards. So when you opened a pack um, of magic, you'd have to, instead of having everything sleeved already, because there's two slots in each pack that have a double-sided card, there's one battle in every pack, and there's one double face card, a transform card in every pack. So there's always two. There's a chance for three, because the um, foil slot could have a dual face card as well. But what they had all the players do is when they opened the packs, they had them hold up all of the double face cards that were in their pack and they'd look around the table and show all their friends uh what dual face cards they opened revealing a bunch of information that doesn't really seem super necessary um in a draft pod so you can see here reed duke was our featured drafter in pod one um on friday and he immediately opened up a invasion of fiora and that's a huge board wipe it's a great card people especially in limited are very excited to draft that card so it was very obvious that uh reed duke one of the best players ever to play the game was going to take this invasion of fiora so it's really awkward to share that information with your table mates immediately as soon as you open a pack um and then once they had all looked around and spied everyone else's dual face cards, they had everyone sleeve the cards so that you were drafting from sleeved cards. Um, and it makes zero sense why they didn't just sleeve the cards in the draft packs and then tie those up with the little piece of paper that they tie them up with. They're already stamping all the cards anyway, so they're already looking through all these cards. 
uh, a judge or tournament organizers has to open the draft packs, stamp all the cards so that people know people can't cheat and they can't hide cards that weren't in their draft. Um, and so they're already manhandling these cards. They're already stamping them. Just get one extra person to, you know, spend the five or six. I've heard it takes quite a few hours to stamp and open all of the draft because they do this for literally every draft pod. And there's a few hundred people playing in a pro tour. Um, so obviously it takes a really long time. It's a huge lift to stamp these cards already, but I don't understand why they don't just add just a little bit more work and have the stampers also sleeve the cards. It would make this whole dual face thing easier. I think it's kind of ridiculous that you have to show the rest of your table, your dual face cards, because you're playing in pod. This isn't arena where you're gonna play against random people. This is pod drafting where you're going to see everyone else's dual face cards and you're going to play against those decks because you play against the other people at your table. Um, so it's a little awkward and I think that there's some fine tuning to do in the future. Uh, the next pro tour is going to be in July, I believe. Um, July 28th to 30th. So they have a little bit of time to kind of pick up those pieces and make it a little bit smoother uh I, I think that's just the biggest criticism i have um so friday started off with three rounds of draft and then uh five rounds of sorry not five rounds yeah five rounds of uh, constructed and then we repeated the process on Saturday where we opened up with three rounds of draft and then five rounds of constructed to then cut it down to the top eight so after the draft this was uh, going into round eight so after th uh, three rounds of draft and now six or four rounds of constructed there was only two people that were seven and oh and that was Pedro Chev Chiavito, Chiavetto from Brazil and Jim Davis from the United States. Um, Jim is someone I've been watching for a really long time. So it was really exciting to, to see someone uh, who I have this parasocial relationship with, who I cheer for, um, do so well on Friday. And so they had to do a head to head match to see, to determine the only undefeated player in day one because you always get paired with people close to your standing and thankfully jim davis won that head-to-head -head and went to bed on friday with the only undefeated record at the pro tour very cool to see um they were playing the rakdos breach deck that most of team fireball uh were playing and then round two day two obviously they pair um, on day one, you get paired randomly for your draft pod. So you get, uh, you know, people that have never played in a pro tour with people that have won pro tours. Generally, they tr probably try not to do that behind the scenes. There's probably a little bit of smudging, um, but it's it's essentially random who you sit with on day one day two your pods are based on your overall record so the featured table on um at draft time was the top eight players in the standings and you can see jim there um there's also nathan stoyer who has been having a hell of a run um after another three rounds of draft and five rounds of standard the top eight wound up being four people from Team Handshake, all playing the Rakdos mid-range deck. Um, and the top eight consisted of Javier Dominguez on Rakdos mid-range. We've got David Olsen on Five Color Ramp, Nathan Stoyer on that same Handshake mid-range deck, uh, Yuan Chen on Azorius Soldiers, Simon Nielsen on Rakdos midrange, Autumn Burchett on Orzov midrange, Carl Sarup on Rakdos midrange, and Kane Reinhardt on Rakdos reanimator. It was very exciting. Uh, obviously, Rakdos is absolutely killing it right now. There was, um, if you look at the breakdown, 
Uh, the Rakdos mid-range deck made up for almost 20% of the field, which is really great. It's a healthy field. Um, I think anything under 20% for the top deck means that there's going to be a lot of variety. Unfortunately, the rest of the decks, for the most part, did not perform over the weekend, which is why we wound up seeing so many copies of the same deck-ish, one or two cards different uh, in the top eight. Again, Javier, Javier uh, Nathan, Simon, and Carl are all playing on the same team. They have the same testing team. And so they've developed this deck over the course of a few weeks, testing and designing uh, the way they want their deck to play. So we'll take a look at the next uh, slide, which shows us the semifinals. Um, David Olson was able to beat uh, Dominguez. Uh, Stoyer was able to beat Chen. Nielsen um, lost to Burchett. And Serap lost to Reinhardt. Um, which was really cool because that means that, you know, half or sorry, more than more than half, three quarters of the team handshake Rakdos midrange decks uh, got eliminated right away in the playoffs, um, which was kind of exciting. It meant that we were going to have more variety in the top four and then in the top two. Uh, the finals wound up being Nathan Stoyer on the Rakdos midrange versus uh, Kane Reinhardt on the Rakdos reanimator again kind of proving that that Rakdos black red combo is really strong right now uh, you play Shieldred you play um, Fable of the Mirror Breaker and you win magic games that's that's kind of the the alchemy of the situation right now um, it was really cool to see Nathan again make it to another finals he's the reigning world champion he's made the last three top eights uh, on the Pro Tour, and it's just been exhilarating. People don't play this well for this long. Um, he's put a real hot streak together. Uh, so it's very exciting to see them qualify for the finals. And then Kane Reinhardt is in an MTGO, a seasoned veteran, plays a lot of online and is friends with a lot of these people. But this was their first uh, big shot at a pro tour and made it to the finals and unfortunately has to face the world champion but they had a really cool deck and it worked out uh, well enough to get them all the way to the finals and it was Nathan Stoyer who uh, took home the prize I believe he only dropped one game to Kane um, in the finals it was really great to see Nathan continue this reign of dominance um, on the standard and competitive formats. Again, people don't play this kind of unheard of that someone is having this hot of a streak. It really goes to show how much time and effort and skill Nathan has put into developing his magic uh, play skills, his thought processes, um, just his overall uh, game smarts and intelligence there's huge congratulations are in order for nathan and his continued success i'm very excited to see what happens uh at pro tour barcelona in july see if nathan can make it four for four on top eights i believe he's been in the last three top eights the rakdos mid-range deck performed really well um this is going to be a, a powerhouse deck in the format for a long time um, and we'll get into why it's going to be even longer than you think in a, just a minute but I just want to take the time to congratulate Nathan there was this really awkward um, bit at the end uh, after Nathan had won his entire team came on the stage and it was very obvious that Kane was distraught having just lost he was sitting there at his chair he uh gave nathan a hug and congratulated him they might have shared a few words they weren't broadcasting the microphones from the main stage but um his team was celebrating and kane was just sitting there and it, i felt like nobody noticed and there wasn't a lot of positive sportsmanship i, I have a background in like organized sports and sportsmanship is something I hold very dear to my heart and something that uh, I have a lot of respect for when sportsmanship is shown. And I think that we 
as a, the magic community have have a lot of things to, to work on as far as being welcoming and being cordial and kind of you know curating this friendly place and i think that we need to go above and beyond the stigma of you know like nerds playing a nerd game gatekeepy bullshit um we need to go above and beyond and show more sportsmanship than we normally would in another scenario because we want people to feel more welcome than normal it's the only way to to grow the game it's the only thing that is going to encourage other people to come in and stay and it's it's a huge uh wall that keeps people out at times so if you have an opportunity to show your sportsmanship and be a good sport uh do so I'm not really knock trying to knock Team Handshake or or Nathan and his group of friends. Um, it was just something I noticed, and and that kind of thing kind of just creeps up and eats away at me on the inside a little bit. So definitely take the time to congratulate your opponent, uh, thank them for the games. Um, you know, Kane played his ass off all weekend and made it to the finals at a pro tour. And that is not something to balk at or bat your eyelashes at. I think that, you know, Kane deserves a ton of props. There's a lot of people that have been playing a long time that have never um, top aided a pro tour, let alone made it to the finals. So congratulations to Nathan for winning uh, and congratulations to Kane for putting up one hell of a fight to get there and then a great fight in the finals. Um, yeah, and that's that's it. That's it for the Pro Tour. It was an exciting weekend. I had a lot of fun watching. The coverage was fantastic, as always. Although they're doing this new thing where they're recording a lot of the stuff uh, live and then kind of the playback is delayed so that they can cut out all the shuffling and the between matches stuff. So they kind of cut from one match to another. And I did find that it moved really fast in that scenario. Um, maybe it's just because I watch a lot of old Pro Tour coverage through, you know, shout out the Will Hall experience on Twitch. Uh, give them a follow if you don't. They're always broadcasting old Pro Tour coverage. Um, but I, I, I feel like I miss some of the banter and the storytelling and the um, constructed segments in this new version of the Pro Tour because the gameplay is so quick and there's not a lot of downtime. So they're not trying to fill as much time anymore because they've got all this footage that they've now cut uh, all the shuffling out of and, and the preparation. So they jump from one game to the next to the next and then move on. Uh, just, uh, just my two cents. I like it. I still had fun. I st it was still a great watch. Uh, the broadcast talent is insane. Uh, the on-screen talent, the commentators, um, the play-by-play -play and the color commentators. Um, every Everyone did an amazing job. I'm so excited to see uh, the next Pro Tour because they make it so much fun uh, and informative. And it's just a great watch. I had a great weekend soaking in all this pro coverage. And shout out to the entire uh, Wizards and Magic uh, broadcast team because it was great. Not a lot of hiccups production-wise either. Uh, there was a few random camera switches, a few microphone moments, but uh, it's really, really, really hard to do a live broadcast of an event. And I see people slagging the broadcast team on the internet all the time, and it's just like you have no idea how hard it is. Uh, so little hiccups like switching to the wrong camera it is no big deal. That's to be expected. It happens at the... NFL level it'll happen at the Magic Pro Tour uh, don't stress about it they did it a fantastic job keep it up um, the last thing I wanted to talk about before we say goodbye for the day is that during the Pro Tour uh, they made um, an announcement about Standard and they are revitalizing Standard is what they're calling it so let me just read this article and um, we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, Standard is and has long been a vital to the thriving local game stores. 
regular play, a robust competitive tabletop scene, local metagames, and that cheeky, friendly competitive edge is infused into so many local game stores that when standard struggles, stores take note. Um, maybe I'm not... This is a little fluffy, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, I don't think. Basically, what they've decided is that... Um, Starting with the current standard environment, the s standard sets are only going to rotate every three years rather than every two years. So prior to this change, we were going to see a rotation this fall that was going to cut out everything from the beginning of 2021. So we would have lost Kamigawa. Uh, yeah, we would have lost the Innistrads, Kamigawa, um streets of new capenna we would have lost everything up until i guess dominar united i think that's how it works where where it would have cut off anyway they've decided to extend it another year so they're going to rotate every three years which means that we're going to get an entire extra calendar year with cards like um Shieldred, the Apocalypse, and Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Uh, these cards that have been uh, the Wandering Emperor, cards that have been absolute staples in Standard since they were released. Um, you can't play red mana without playing four copies of Fable of the Mirror Breaker if you want to be competitive. Um, and so those are the kind of cards that are, have just seeped into the DNA of competitive and Standard. Um, so one thing... They, they talk about their intentions. Um, so let's go over their intentions real quick. Their first one, the first of note is that this will give standard cards more longevity. Time and time again, we hear players want to play with cards they love and enjoy longer. Standard is our only rotating format. And while keeping it fresh is important, we also feel that there's a more effective middle ground. I, I can agree with that. I don't think a three year rotation is that bad. I think it's okay. I think the only reason why the conversation is happening, that it's uh, not a great move, is because of cards like Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Um, their next note is that it will allow mechanics and archetypes to be more effectively built on over time. Uh, one thing that was a criticism is that because a lot of mechanics are set specific or block specific, uh, these things weren't built out over time if you think of like the streets of new capenna casualty uh mechanic which is a little bit i guess of a soft example but um because it only exists in that one format there's not a lot of expansion on it so they're hoping that with a broad, wider breadth of cards and time that they can develop some of these mechanics with more sets that include these mechanics which makes the decks that are constructed around those mechanics a lot stronger. We saw a really great example um, in Phyrexia All Will Be One. That Pro Tour had a ton of Selesnya Toxic decks, but then the next set came out and there was no Toxic de cards in the set at all. So the, the support cards kind of fell off because they were better used in other decks. And all of a sudden you have one set that supports uh an archetype or a keyword and then the immediate next set does not so it kind of wavers a bit and the longer that they have to pull cards from the longer we have to pull cards from as players the more opportunities we have to find other sets that might have toxic in it maybe they're going to put something out this fall that has toxic in it now we have you know two sets to pull from it's it's just kind of things like that that help the mechanics and archetypes uh, develop and evolve over time the more cards that are available to you as a deck builder the more you can bolster those archetypes and mechanics um, and then the last bit is that it also gives us stronger tools to create an environment where decks are more colors and mechanics like green white toxic blue white soldiers and less mid-range so again this is kind of just point number two point five um 
with the bolstering of mechanics and archetypes, you're going to see more decks like green and white toxic versus more decks that are just mid-range. And mid-range has kind of become the universal term for all of the good cards in these colors um, having a longer rotation of standard cards means that those mechanics and archetypes are going to get time investment and design investment which means that you're no longer going to have to just play all the good cards you can focus on specific archetypes which is really great for the game because then you don't have a bunch of uh, similar decks you have two decks that are trying to do completely different things battling each other and i think that that's kind of where the the most potent and fun magic is born is when you know two players design these cool things around cool mechanics and then they sit down and they see which one is better or who can play theirs better um i'm excited for that period um and that's really it. Basically, the entire announcement is that they're pushing the standard rotation window from two years to three years. Um, maybe let's see a standard rotation MTG. Rotation guide. Oh. Rotates out September. Okay, so... I think they've adapted this May 7th. Yeah, okay. So this stuff would have rotated out this September, but now it says that it's going to rotate out uh, next September. And that is... Wait a second. My bad. I'm just trying to... trying to get my screen to not be rude like this don't know why okay um so I'll, I'll use this right example instead of the left example so this stuff would have rotated out next september because of the two-year window but now it's going to rotate out in september 2025 so like DMU, everything that came out since last summer, DMU, Brothers War, Phyrexia All Will Be One, March of the Machine, Aftermath. Um, and then this fall, we'll start the new cutoff. The summer is always the cutoff, the end of the summer. Um, and like this September, we were counting on Innistrad, Midnight Hunt, Crimson Vow, Neon Dynasty, and New Capenna to all rotate out. But now that it's been pushed another year, we have another year of these cards, um, which is both a good and a bad thing. I think that the the main criticism I have for this announcement as it stands is that they need to do a more functioning, uh, intricate and purposeful banning and uh, restrictions list. So they haven't banned a lot of cards in Standard over the years since I've started playing Standard. Um, there's been a few cards that are egregious that were banned eventually. Um, and I think that in order to facilitate this revitalization that they're looking for to breathe more life into this um, game type, into standard they need to ban some of the cards that are in every single deck because they're too good not to play um before meat hook massacre was banned if you played black you literally had to play four meat hook massacres otherwise three or four give or take um otherwise you just were down a tool like your deck was objectively worse for not having meat hook massacres in it and they need to do the same for cards like fable of the mirror breaker i think even shieldred the apocalypse even though it can be dealt with fairly easily um i would put uh atraxa on there as well um these cards that are so good and so potent that it makes no sense not to include them are the cards that should be on their hit list and i'm sure that they have a very uh 
in-depth hit list for potential bans and restrictions in standard um I think they and Huey's probably doing as much as they can to to do this, but I think they need to be vocal. They need to be upfront. They need to be honest. They need to they need to consistently keep in contact with standard players uh, so that we feel like we're being seen, that we're being heard. Um, they have our best interest. Uh, they have fun and um, comp competition in front of mind when they're talking about standard um which is something we're not getting a ton of these days with wizards of the coast putting a lot of weight into commander and um casual formats and i don't mean casual in an offensive way i just mean like people that play commander almost I know a bunch of them that don't play any other format of magic or any other version of magic um so I think they they need to do a good job of reinstilling confidence in standard fans and standard players. And I think, you know, communication is of utmost importance. Uh, objective and even subjective conversations about bans and restrictions. I like the fact that we're getting an extra year of these cards. I think if financially it makes more sense. It takes down the the barrier of entry quite a bit uh not completely because it's still a rotating format but it takes it down a little bit um but yeah i just hope that they do something to shake up the card lists that are in every single deck and i hope that this sees great success i i love playing fable the mirror breaker I think it's a fantastic card. It's a really cool design, um, but it is in every red deck and it's in every deck that even has a little bit of red in it. Um, and I feel like that's cause to be concerned. Concerned. Uh, let me know what you think about the uh, new standard rotation news, revitalizing standard as they are calling it. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of a three-year standard rotation. Uh, what do you think about another year of sh Shieldreds on the battlefield? An extra year. We thought we were only going to have to wait one more year. Now we have to wait two more years. 2025, we are getting rid of Shieldred. Um, that is bonkers to me, but uh, also exciting because there's a lot of really cool stuff in all these sets that never got to see the light of day because mid-range is the king and if you don't play mid-range then you're losing um but let me know in the comments below what you think they might sh ban or what you think they should ban what's what's your most grown worthy card in standard right now let me know um and again congratulations to uh nathan stoyer for winning pro tour march of the machine congratulations to kane reinhardt for making it all the way to the finals putting up a valiant effort Congrats to the entire Wizards uh, organized group uh, for what I hear was a fantastic in-person tournament. Um, and yeah, fix the dual-sided cards in draft. And I think we're smooth sailing. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk about standard and competitive magic. Ooh, ah, I get so jazzed up. Um, if you haven't, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're trying really hard to kind of bolster our subscription numbers, our watch numbers, our comments, our likes, all great. I'm so excited every time I reload the page to see what the new stats are. Uh, we just need to get the subscriber numbers up. It's kind of on a slow crawl upwards. Um, and we unlock a lot of new tools and ability uh, for us to kind of monetize and have access to more things if we get our subscriber number up. And I think that that's going to be a big help in in letting me kind of turn around and put more time and effort into uh, this show. Right now we're on a two-week rotation. So every two weeks we're putting out an episode of Delver. I'd love to go back to one week, um, but I just don't have the time or the resources to do this show every week. So we're doing it every two weeks. It's been working out really well. I'm really excited about it. Um, and yeah, I hope 
you guys are enjoying it as well. Thank you so much for being here. I know I say that all the time, but I really, really mean it. I really mean it. Uh, you are a great person, I'm sure, and the world would be a worse place without you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up and thank you for giving me some of your time. May all of your opening hands be keeps and may all your opponents mulligan Thank you so much. I I hope you see cute dogs and and eat something delicious. Um, okay, bye. I love you. <laughs>